Great. So um, thanks to Sam for the introduction. Uh, like you said, my name's uh, Dan Peterson um, and down at the bottom there is my Twitter handle um, and the hashtag for Romancing the Gothic. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, a Gothic Madonna, or at least the Gothic world Madonna, relating to those three titles that I've put there, very grand titles, aristocracy, sex and religion. I prefaced the, um, the, the talk in the morning and I should do it again in the evening. Uh, by saying that despite appearances um, and despite having paid quite a lot of money to go and see Madonna live and um, enjoying her records, I'm not the biggest fan of Madonna. I like her music, um, but the biggest fan certainly in our household is my wife Kat, um, who's on um, watching in the audience today. So she may heckle um, <laughs> through if I get things wrong or um, against her liking. But Kat herself only became a fan of Madonna back when she was younger. And she uh, apparently sent her mum um, out to buy um, not a Madonna record, but True Colours by Cindy Lauper. And with traditional um, parent style, Helen, her mum, came back um, with True Blue by Madonna, by mistake. Um, but a happy mistake, and one which um, uh, became history, as we say. So um, I'd like to dedicate this to my mother-in-law, Helen Irving. Um, who got both of us in uh, by um, tricky roots into the music of Madonna. Um, so I'm going to be talking through, and it is about um, a, a number of um, topics. Uh, so I've put content warnings at the bottom, uh, content warnings for discussions of sex and sexuality, um, of AIDS and AIDS-related issues, s and uh, religion, and a brief fictional mention of assault in the video uh, for Like a Prayer. Um, I don't think anything is um, too uh, explicit or in-depth, but that's just to, uh, to let people know. But just in case you've um, uh, come down out of space in the last couple of uh, days and don't know who Madonna is, it's probably worth going through a quick biography and the kind of world um, that she is working in over the period that I'm going to be talking about. So Madonna was born in 1958 and her full name is Madonna Louise Ciccone and she was born in Bay City in Michigan. Um, and very sadly, only uh, five years after that, her mother, who was also called Madonna Louise, died of cancer. And that is kind of a landmark in Madonna's um, life. It's obviously a great upheaval. She was very close to her mother. Um, and that is something that does seem to come back in a lot of her uh, work. There's that kind of sense of loss. And that was then compounded a few years later uh, when her father, Tony Ciccone, remarried. Um, and Madonna and her siblings um, had some resentment for quite some time around that. Um, three years, probably to a child doesn't seem that long. Um, and I think she does work through that again in a, in a few, um, few songs of hers. But the biography that we have of her at school um, seems to see it. She seems to have not necessarily been a troublemaker. Um, she didn't always follow the rules and she's often remarked as being quite a tomboy um, in her earlier uh, life, but she um, did well at school. Um, she studied and got good grades and she was very um, involved in dance as a kind of extracurricular um, activity. And that again, I think obviously comes through later on uh, in the work that she does. But in 1978, when she's 20, um, fairly abruptly, uh, Madonna decides to leave Michigan and move to New York City. And that for a young person who's wanting to get ahead in, um, in doing music or art or culture or anything like that, or even simply getting out of Michigan, um, is not necessarily uh, the strangest decision to make. But if we look um, at the at New York of the time and leading up to that time, it makes us think uh, not necessarily the New York uh, that we might think of today. So in 1975, a few years before Madonna moved to New York City, the New York City fiscal crisis hit. And that is a grand name for the fact that the city ran completely out of money. There was no money um, uh, in liquidity to pay for things, buy services and goods for the city, and they'd also completely run out of credit. So they had no way of um, making loans um, or anything like that. And rapidly, city services, uh, municipal services, started to fall by the wayside and New York started to become a fairly dark place to live. And the year after that, not necessarily a symptom, but certainly something that compounded um, those problems, 
He had a man called David Berkowitz, more properly known, at least to the newspapers, as the son of Sam. And he began what can only really be called a killing spree. Over 1976, and I think early 77, he killed by shooting six random people in the streets of New York and injured at least a dozen others. He was eventually caught, um, but that um, added to the fear of living into what was becoming um, a fairly lawless and downtrodden town city. And then in 1977, the year before Madonna moved to New York, there was the New York blackout. And that was a weekend of electricity failures, um, initially triggered uh, by a lightning strike that hit um, effectively a substation, and then that caused a rolling um, problems throughout the network. But it also, the root cause of it was largely the fact that the city hadn't been able to pay upkeep on their infrastructure. So if you think 1978, Madonna's moving to um, a city which has effectively become a haunted house. Everything is empty. There is no money to keep things up, um, up, uh, up kept. There is a killer on the loose and the lights are flickering and going out. But for the next few years after she moved there, she worked a number of day jobs, largely waitressing. Um, a number of her biographies said that she worked in a number of Dunkin' Donuts shops. Um, and then at nighttime, she studied dance. And she studied dance under Martha Graham, amongst other people, a very famous choreographer. So she was at that level um, even back then when she would have been 21. Those, um, those years after that, uh, she forms and plays in a number of small bands, kind of uh, New York post-punky bands largely, um, but few of them go anywhere um, and she um, eventually chooses to go solo. And if you want to learn more about that, and it's quite an interesting um, period of time because I think most people think of Madonna as a, certainly as a, a solo singer um, and dancer, but perhaps not much more than that. But she started off as a drummer and then a guitarist and a singer. Um, so I don't, I think even she wouldn't call herself an accomplished musician, but she certainly was um, a musician. And there's a film released last year called Madonna and the Breakfast Club. Um, I can't say it's the best film ever in the world. Um, it's a kind of docudrama style. Um, some of um, parts of Madonna's life are fictionalized by actors, intercut with um, documentary talking head footage from friends and peers of the time. Many of them are, um, I say as middle, approaching a middle-aged man, middle-aged men who never got anywhere in music. So their remembrances are slightly skewed, but it's certainly interesting um, to think about 1980s, very early um, post-punk kind of music. But as she goes solo and she starts singing in clubs, um, singing songs that she'd written herself with backing singers and dancers in clubs, in 1981, that's quite a timely time to be doing this kind of thing, because MTV aired for the very first time, playing Buggles' uh, video killed the radio star, um, and at least for a time, playing music videos. After that, things start to accelerate quite rapidly for Madonna. In 82, her first single, Everybody, is released, and that same year, the, the disease and the sort of this uh, syndrome of various diseases that has been spreading across the city, um, covering a, in uh, a pall of fear, is finally giving its name of AIDS. The um, disease had existed for uh, uh, quite a long time, but the actual name of AIDS was only given in 82. So again, that kind of adds this kind of fear that's haunting the city and the wider world, of course. In 1983, her first album, uh, Madonna, a uh, self-titled album is released and that features everybody and also songs like Holiday, um, quite a pop, upbeat album. Um, but even at that early stage, she realised, um, perhaps ironically, given that she is still now releasing music, that she wouldn't be able to be a pop star for her entire life. So she looked to move um, to other art forms and the, the sort of main uh, one would be acting. And she played the title role, um, not necessarily the, the main um, and uh, protagonist role, but the title role of Desperately Seeking Susan playing Susan herself. And this is a film, a kind of knockabout, um, kind of a screwball comedy in a more, more modern style, but the, um, the centre of it is some jewellery that's been stolen for, uh, from a mobster and the attempt to um, uh, get, the, get that back from the mobsters and also to, to, um, to stay safe from the other characters. And that's interesting, because in 1985, a character called Big Paulie Castellano, who's capo of the Gambino family, a mafia mobster, 
was shot dead in the streets of New York under the orders of John Gotti. And that meant that John Gotti could take over the family. So in 1985, you've got mobsters shooting each other dead in the streets in broad daylight. A few years later, we now get into the sort of era I'm talking about. So Like a Prayer is released, and that becomes a very controversial album and single. But at the same time, David Dinkins is elected New York's um, uh, mayor, and he's the first black mayor to be elected in the city. And he starts to bring in a number of um, uh, schemes and uh, various bits of work trying to bring New York back from this brink that it's found itself on. And they work through the next few years, and we'll probably see that coming out in some of the things I talk about later on. A year after Like a Prayer, we've got Vogue, um, which comes out, um, possibly one of her most famous albums. We'll be talking about that uh, next after this introduction. And at the same year, uh, the Blonde Ambition Worldwide Tour, one of the largest tours at the time that's ever been undertaken, um, uh, starts off, and that causes worldwide controversy. Um, we'll see what uh, Pope John Paul II thinks about it later on in the uh, presentation. Suffice to say, he wasn't a fan. But again, when this kind of vast um, entertainment um, piece is kicking off, the same year, a man called Brian Watkins, who was a tourist from Utah, who uh, come to New York with his family, was shot dead on the platform of the subway by muggers. And that's a terrible thing. His, uh, some of his family were also killed, uh, and a number of them were injured. But Brian Watkins, sadly, was only one of 2,245 other people recorded, not necessarily actual, but recorded as being murdered in New York in that year. 1992, we see Erotica released, and that's another one that we'll be talking about uh, later on today. Um, but in interesting, in that same year, we see crime rates start to drop. New York becomes um, a better place to live. However, I can say that homicide rates halve over the next five years. That sounds good. It still means that around a thousand people are being murdered every year in the city. And those, uh, those drops are largely due to the initiatives that David Dinkins brought in. But the, the, um, the glory and the accountability will be taken by the incumbent New York uh, um, mayor, a man called Rudy Giuliani, who we still hear of today. So we're not here necessarily, though, to talk about Madonna herself. We're all here to talk about my kind of madcap idea about Gothic Madonna. So is Madonna Gothic? And what do we mean when we talk about that? Well, I think there's some images there. And through her career, um, from the start, Madonna's used these kind of Gothic aesthetics. We've got at the uh, bottom left, Frozen, uh, which is one I think a lot of people have mentioned on Twitter, um, things like that, when they talk, think about uh, Madonna's gothic aesthetic. You've got this kind of um, witch imagery, crows, flowing robes, um, very monochrome black on these kind of muted blues. And also they have the, through the video, you have this transformation where she changes into smoke and to birds uh, and various things. But you also have above it, uh, Rain, um, another one of my favorite of her songs actually, which has this kind of Joan of Arc um, penitent look she has her very um, sort of short and dark hair, which is um, not super usual for Madonna, but also again, kind of dark uh, backgrounds and her um, skin kind of shining out as a contrast. But even before that, at uh, the top right, uh, there's a still from Borderline, very early single, and that's got these kind of, again, black and white monochrome, um, her being very um, active, dancing throughout these very still pillars, which I think has quite a gothic um, appeal. And then down in the bottom right, of course, you've got uh, the mist shrouded canals of Venice and Madonna floating along in a gondola. But are these aesthetics really enough? Um, a lot of 80s and 90s music use these very stark images, certainly in their music videos. And if you want to go back through uh, the YouTube ar archives, there's a really good talk from Evan, who um, did one specifically on um, 80s and, and 90s uh, gothic music videos. Um, which is a good one to go back and look to. Quite a nice companion for the one I'm talking about now. I think though, more than just the aesthetics, Madonna, um, and I think consciously, uses this really vivid understanding that she has of Gothic ideas. And there's three main ones that I've listed there, which I'm going to talk about. This idea of a constructed self, 
So not necessarily the, um, the identity that you're issued with, but the identity that you make for yourself. And I think that's inherent in pop stars and pop music. Um, there are persona and there are um, masks that um, certainly pop stars wear. But you also then have this idea of visualizations of power and restraint and how power is exercised and how restraint has its different, even restraint can be an active thing and a use of power. And you've got there on the, um, on the right hand side, this is the back cover of Madonna, the album, her very first album. Um, she, from, right from very early, she has a lot of chains, bangles that are very kind of restrictive and heavy um, and that kind of idea of power, but she's wielding the power. She's the one holding the chain. And then I think this more subtle idea of chiaroscuro, the conflict and the relationship between light and dark. And you've got that again in that picture. Part of her face is in shadow, part of it is lit, um, but she's gazing at us. So even from the shadows, she's kind of looking out at us. And I think as well, crucially, not just the presentation of these, um, these kind of theoretical ideas, but she also has an understanding of how these things are seen as transgressive by established power structures. And I think, in all honesty, largely from Madonna, it is a way of uh, drawing attention to herself and selling records. But equally, I think she genuinely does use these to talk about um, quite deeper ideas through her music, through the artwork and um, like photography and stuff that she's involved in, but specifically through the music videos that she releases. And it's those that I'll be speaking about um, in the main part of the talk. But I wanted to get in a little bit about this idea of um, transgression. And we've got there um, a quick quote from Fred Botting's book, The Gothic. And he says that Gothic art remains fascinated by objects and practices that are constructed as negative, irrational, immoral and fantastic. And I think the word constructed there is most important because it's not things that we seem to see as self-evidently negative. It's not things like poverty. It's not things like abuse. It's not things like theft and the way that um, structures um, um, monitor and kind of oppress the people who live under them. It's stuff that is constructed and negative, often as a kind of smokescreen for the things that genuinely are negative. And there's a quote there following that from Madonna herself, and this is when MTV banned Justify My Love. I think they played it like three times um, and then eventually uh, banned it. And she asks, why is it that people are willing to go and watch a movie about someone getting blown to bits for no reason at all, and nobody wants to see two girls kissing and two men snuggling? So things, affection and intimacy, things that I don't think really anybody would think of as bad, certainly nobody here, I don't think, is seen as negative, immoral. But somebody getting blown to bits is just happenstance, it's just commonplace, and you'll see that largely in any um, film. And here, this relates back to the Gothic, because we've got a review here by John Wilson Croker, and it's from 1818, so it's not a review of Madonna, but it is a review of Frankenstein, by Mary Shelley. And Croker says that Frankenstein is a tissue of horrible and disgusting absurdity. It inculcates no lesson of conduct, manners or morality. It cannot mend and will not even amuse its readers unless their tastes have been deplorably vitiated. So Croker believes that Frankenstein is not, not only a worthless piece of art, it is a negative, a disgusting piece of art. And the only people who will enjoy it are people who have been so corrupted by similar pieces of art. What um, Coleridge below calls beggarly daydreaming, his um, um, description of the Gothic. And it's only those people who are already lost to us and who are already disgusting uh, and vitiated will enjoy this kind of art. But that's contrasted by Paul Epworth, a modern uh, contemporary record producer. And he says that pop music has greater power to change people and to affect people because it's a universal language. You don't have to understand music to understand the power of a pop song. And it's that, I think, that's frightening to establishment thinkers. But why, what, what do we do when these people who don't understand anything enjoy something? This is popular music and it's populist music. So it's made for people and it's made by people who haven't gone through the regime 
that we think you need to go through to be able to do something worthwhile. And this will come back up again later on um, as we talk about some of the music. So to go through the rest of the sort of framework of the talk, I'm going to talk about the three um, songs, three singles. First one is Vogue. And I'm going to talk about this idea that I have of aristocracy and the constructed self. Then erotica, and we'll talk about um, sex, sexuality, and visualizations of power and restraint. And we'll have like a prayer, finally, which we will look at religion, this idea of chiaroscuro and light and dark conflicting with each other. So Vogue, first of all, released in March 1990, and it was written by Madonna and um, a producer called Chet Pettibone. It was hugely popular and hugely um, successful. Number, number one in over 30 countries, and it was 1990's best-selling single across the world. Two million sales of the single in, the, in 1990 itself, and six million to date. The video, which is what I will be talking about largely, uh, is directed by David Fincher. And interestingly, the year after directing the book, he would direct Alien 3, um, a, a contentious entry in the Alien series itself, but one that I really like, and one I think is a very gothic film. So perhaps some of the ideas from Vogue carried over into that film for him. But we have a clip of uh, the video, um, just to remind you, um, if you uh, haven't <laughs> listened to it for a while, why not, if you haven't? Um, so I'll run this. I won't run it all the way through, uh, much to uh, the audience's disappointment, no doubt, um, but then we will talk about the music itself. I think we'll get them too excited early on a, a Sunday morning. Um, but if you, uh, if you want the, uh, the full thing, it is available on many of your streaming services. So why am I talking about aristocracy with, uh, in relation to Vogue? Well, it's kind of um, a little bit of uh, tongue in cheek for myself, but I think it works. I think if you, when you look at that video, it has this very aristocratic feel. Um, it is set in what is assumedly a large kind of mansion. Um, there are um, uh, Lempica um, paintings on the wall, uh, not something that everyone has scattered around their house. And the figures that move through this mansion have a very austere aristocratic feel to them. They kind of have um, not necessarily sneering faces, but they're very dismissive and they move through it in a very kind of um, organized and formal way. And I think Madonna realized this, and it's probably maybe even intentional right from the very start, that it ha should have this aristocratic feeling. Because in the 1990 MTV Video Music Awards, um, the year of the release of the single, she did a live performance of the song inspired by the film Dangerous Liaisons. And the film itself is inspired by an epistopic no uh, epistol epistolic novel, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, by Pierre Chaudelot de Laclo. And that book, depicts the corruption and the um, fall of the French nobility just prior to the revolution. Self is a very gothic novel about the collapse of houses and nobility. And that's, um, that connection is not just an aesthetic one. In the, video, in the performance um, for Vogue, Madonna wears the same dress that Glenn Close herself wears um, in the film. But for me, I would like to con concentrate on the actual video and Vogue as a dance form um, and how that itself, the history of it, brings up this idea of aristocracy. And the Vogue was introduced first to Madonna um, by a dancer called Jose Gutierrez Extravaganza um, at the Sound Factory nightclub in New York. And he, as you can see there in that GIF, also appears in the video for Vogue and worked as one of the choreographers for the music video. And Vogue is a dance form that existed um, long before uh, the Vogue video itself. It's one of these ones that's kind of um, erupted out of different forms of dance. There's a number of people who say they either invented it or they finessed it. But what we know is that um, it is a dance that employs these exaggerated and artificial movements. And many of them can be boiled down to dismissive gestures, so hands waving people away, um, raising their hand to dismiss somebody who's trying to talk to them. You get this mimicry of the rigid stances of fashion models, especially of um, the late 80s and 90s. And it's no um, surprise that it's called, no coincidence that the, uh, the dance is called Vogue, because it is inspired 
by models on the cover of Vogue magazine. And it also has this pretense of applying makeup or garments of masking oneself with, um, with other appearances. And you can see there in that gift there, a dancer called Willie Ninja, who again um, with Gutierrez was one of the kind of developers of the Vogue. At the end of his, um, that short routine, he seems to apply um, powder to his face. And this again, like the Vogue video, it is combined these kinds of um, over the top movements, these kind of very expressive movements is combined with impassive and austere facial expressions. There's very little emotion comes out through the face itself, which again is a form of masking and a kind of form of um, denying uh, the self. Costume as well is often used to uh, usurp these gen gender expectations that we might have. Um, you see that uh, less so in the video, the men are in very um, severe suits, but Madonna herself switches between what you might expect male and female um, dress to be. And also Vogue is a competitive dance and not only competitive, it has combative elements. So it is normally done as a duel, um, sometimes more than two people dancing together. And the aim largely is to pin your opponent. So to get them to a place where they can no longer dance expressively, but you can and specifically without physical contact. So you can't trip them to the ground, you can't pin them or anything like that. You have to maneuver them into a space where they are dancing to, um, to a lesser effect than you are, which is, I think is quite interesting. There's other dances that do that, but the way Vogue works, I think is, um, especially while trying to remain in passive and austere, it adds a kind of uh, um, an interesting flux to it. And Gutierrez, along with Willie Ninja and people like Paris Dupre developed this dance as part of their performances at what are referred to as New York Balls. And New York Balls are part of New York Ball culture, and that's a largely African-American and Latin American underground subculture of performance that combines dance, theatre and modelling. And it's very specifically an LGBTQ+, a very wide encompassing um, uh, sort of culture um, and um, performance culture. And that itself, although it does come across and it's often very portrayed as a very 80s subculture, comes from as far back as the late 19th century in the US, when there were things called drag balls. And they were created specifically in defiance of laws passed in um, United States cities and across states, which made it a crime for a person to appear in public in a dress not belonging to his or her sex. So choosing to wear clothes, um, that were keyed as the opposite sex was a criminal offence, could have, see you in prison, see you fined. And the, um, the fines and the imprisonment sentences were um, long for this offence. And there's a quote there from Transgender History in the United States by Jenny Beeman. Um, and it says that one of the earliest known drags took place in Washington DC on New Year's Eve in 1885. The event was documented by the Washington Evening Star because a participant, Miss Maud, was arrested while returning home the following morning. Dressed in a pink dress, trimmed with white lace, with stockings and undergarments to match, the male assigned 30-year-old black defendant was charged with vagrancy and sentenced to three months in jail, even though the judge, the newspaper reported, admired his stylish appearance. So back in 1885, we've got, uh, I think it's quite interesting, we've got terms like male assigned. And we've also got, even though it was illegal, um, a Miss Moore's walking the streets in a pink, pink dress trimmed with white lace, which is not the kind of clothing you would wear if you wanted to uh, be um, undercover or incommunicado. And I think that's largely because um, this kind of um, attitude is explored much more in a film called Paris is Burning, directed by Jenny Livingston, which is a documentary of New York ball culture. And I recommend um, watching that. I find it really, really interesting, a very uh, sort of eye-opening um, documentary of the time um, and of the, um, the kind of, uh, the very maudlin lives of people, certainly marginalized um, and oppressed people uh, of the time in, in uh, New York. It's available online and there's the, a number of editions, the Criterion one there, it's probably the most wide ranging one with a lot of extras. But I think it's interesting because um, this idea of ball culture, going back through these drag balls, offers this uh, environment um, where your social class 
your level of education, your financial standing becomes largely irrelevant. No one cares where you've come from, what you know, how much you can afford. It's all about um, involving yourself in the performance and creating a persona. And equally, your personal history is inconsequential, if not actively rejected. Many people um, who go to New York do so because they are um, fleeing something rather than looking for something. But specifically, um, people of, um, who were marginalized and oppressed found solace and found um, companionship and um, you know, their own society within ball culture. And if you're wanting to reject the things that may have happened to you in the past, I think that's very welcoming and rightly so. And from that, because if your past and all the trappings of your past are gone, you can then recreate and recreate your own identity at will. And this system of debts and burdens, not necessarily financial, often financial, but also um, kind of the expectations that are placed on you by society, especially capitalist patriarchal societies, are denied. You don't have to worry about them anymore when you're within um, a ball and part of ball culture. And that's then getting to this idea of aristocracy. And if we look at the word of um, aristocratic, it comes from the Greek, aristos, meaning excellent, and kratos, meaning power. It is the rule of those considered most excellent by their own peers and within their own rules, not by the judgment of external systems. So within your own kind of clique, you can, as it says in the, in the gif at the bottom, own everything. And that ties in, I think, to this quote here at the bottom by um, Judith Butler from an interview. And she says that it's my view that gender is culturally formed, but it's also a domain of agency or freedom. So if something like gender is culturally formed and assigned, you can also reject that assignment and recreate your own ideas of what gender is and what gender should be through this kind of aristocratic view of defining things within your own system. So as Madonna says herself in that quote, it makes no difference if you're black or white, if you're a boy or a girl, you're a superstar, yes, that's what you are. And read out in pop song lyrics, that may sound a bit trite, but I think that's what she's getting at. I think what she's saying is that you don't have to accept the assigned self. You're a boy, you're a girl, you're rich, you're poor, you're clever, you're stupid, whatever. You can then have, take your own preferences and construct up your own self, which I think is um, a, a very a kind of enlightening kind of idea. So I'll move on from that uh, to Erotica, which was released in 1992, so a couple of years later. It was written by Madonna and Shep Pettibone and also another producer called Anthony Shimkin. It was less commercially successful um, than Vogue, but it is still a well-known song of Madonna's. And it did have the highest debut in the history of the Hot 100 airplay chart in the US. And that's not sales, but the amount of plays it gets on radio stations. And that went in at number two, um, which is, as it says, the highest debut. The video for Erotica was directed by fashion photographer Fabian Barron. Um, he works and has uh, developed a lot of um, art design for multiple versions of Vogue um, across the, the world and various other high-end fashion magazines. And like Justify My Love, which we mentioned before, Erotica was also eventually banned by MTV. So I'm going to run another little quick um, clip for the start of Erotica before we carry on and talk a bit about that. That one there, quite short, um, because it ties nicely from the previous um, discussion about Vogue, in that she, uh, Madonna explicitly um, uh, keys herself as a character in Erotica, Mistress Dita. So she herself, as she often has done between albums and kind of between eras, constructs this new self. Um, but there's only a handful of other times, I think, when she explicitly names the characters. Um, so this is, I think, quite interesting and quite a nice segue between the two. But Erotica, um, inevitably, is explicitly, in more ways than one, explicitly about sex. But it's also about these ideas, these, I think, quite gothic ideas of power and restraint. Um, Arian Berger in Rolling Stone at the time, in a review, uh, wrote that erotica is everything Madonna has been denounced for being. Meticulous, calculated, domineering and artificial. It accepts, accepts those charges and answers with a brilliant rec record to prove them. <laughs> 
So this is a lot of the criticism of erotica is that it is quite a cold, calculated, artificial song. It's not funky, a lot of people say. It doesn't have this kind of what people might expect, a sexy um, feel to the song. People often compare it to works by people like Prince and things like that. Um, but I think that's the intent. I think Madonna doesn't want it to be like another um, song about sex. And she doesn't want it just to be a song just about sex. And I think the way to contrast this is if we look back to Borderline, very early song from Madonna. Um, this is what people might expect, certainly in the early 80s, as being a kind of romantic song. Uh, in the song and certainly in the video, Madonna is torn between um, her kind of um, local boyfriend and a uh, photographer. It's implied a kind of um, uptown photographer who comes in um, and um, uh, promises to make her famous. But throughout the film, we see her kind of torn between these two men, but also torn um, by what they're doing to her. She's often ignored by them. And you often see her in this kind of stance, quite forlorn, um, either gazing at the, the boyfriend or the photographer or simply looking quite distressed. And the lyrics themselves say borderline, feels like I'm going to lose my mind. You just keep on pushing my love over the borderline. And that doesn't really sound very romantic. It sounds more like abuse to me. It sounds like Madonna is in a situation, the character that Madonna plays is in a situation that she isn't enjoying. And if you contrast that with the lyrics from Erotica, you, we see her saying, if I'm in charge and I treat you like a child, will you let yourself go wild? Let my mouth go where it wants to. And on face value, that does seem much more aggressive. It seems much more sexual rather than sexy. But if you look at the language, she says, if I'm in charge, will you let yourself go wild? So that opens up the idea of consent. There's a question mark, and a question mark can always be answered by a no. It opens up this idea of um, willing consent um, between two or indeed more adults. And you can see from that um, screenshot from the erotic video, um, it may be a slightly sinister smile, but she is smiling. And it seems to be much more enjoyable, at least for Madonna and for the other people who are in the video itself. And this, I think, is very interesting because it relates back to the thoughts of the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And in History of Sexuality, Volume 1, he says that state power is tolerable only on condition that it masks a substantial part of itself. Its success is proportional to an ability to hide its own mechanisms. So the power structures that we live in are um, only tolerable when we can't fully see them, when we aren't fully aware of what they're doing, and specifically what they're doing to us. Power doesn't want to be known. It wants to, uh, you to think that it's a thing that's inevitably there because it isn't really always there. It's a subtle ghost that moves through us. It isn't, of course. We are just so in the machine that we can't actually see it. And that, I think, is tied in together from this, another quote from Foucault, this time from um, a biography of his by David Macy. And he says that one can say that s &M is the eroticization of power the eroticization of strategic relations. The s &M game is very interesting because it's a strategic relation, because it is always fluid. Of course there are roles, but everyone knows very well that those roles can be reversed. Sometimes the scene begins with the master and slave, and at the end, the slave has become the master. And Foucault though very specifically uses the word game because um, a game is a thing that's delineated in a field or a pitch, and something where everybody, hopefully, knows the rules and that when the start of the game is and when the end of the game is. But equally, I think for me, that comment where he says that the roles can be reversed. For power structures, specifically for um, state um, power, that is the worst thing that could ever happen. Not only can people realise that power is being exerted upon them, but they then flip that power. And that is absolutely what the mechanisms of state power don't want to happen. But Madonna reveals this through erotica, but also through Sex, the book that she released, a large format coffee table book of erotic photography stroke pornography, depending on which act, um, angle you're approaching it from. And that came out in 92, uh, just a month after Erotica, the album, and it was intended to be a companion piece to the album. And she says about um, the book and the approach for the book, if people could talk about sex freely, we would have more people practicing safe sex. We wouldn't have people sexually abusing each other. 
I think the second part of that claim is maybe uh, optimistic and or naive, but I think the idea that if people talk about um, something more freely, then that thing becomes more consensual, becomes more informed, and it becomes um, safer. And there's a quote here, there's a quote on this slide and then on the next slide from Barry Walters, who's a journalist for the Rolling Stone, um, and this is in 2017, so he's uh, sort of a retrospective. And he says that at a time when the straight media essentially characterised all sex as dangerous, Madonna tried to illustrate that it could be safe and stimulating, particularly if we open our minds, free our bodies and try something besides standard intercourse. So you have this idea then of um, these structures expecting heterosexual um, standard intercourse, in inverted commas, and Madonna then is looking at how this can be done differently. And Walters continues by saying that something I think is quite a powerful claim, that we've hit a finally hit a tipping point when popular culture is offering more viewpoints and voices. That's why there's a rise in fascism to suppress them. Sex and erotica's greatest contribution remains their embrace of the other, which in this case means queerness, blackness, third wave feminism, exhibitionism and kink. And Madonna took what was marginalised at the worst of the AIDS epidemic, placed it in an emancipated context and shoved it into the mainstream for all to see and hear. And that last section is interesting for two ways, because shoving it into the mainstream for all to see and hear collapses that idea that power should be um, invisible or at least partially hidden. But equally, Madonna is often, and I think often justifiably criticised for appropriating um, the ideas and the kind of cultures of other people. But we have here Barry Walters, a gay man who lived through the AIDS epidemic, as he calls it, and not only that, but lost his partner to AIDS. Um, back in, I think, the 90s. And he's saying that this is an eman emancipated piece of work. I think that's quite powerful to hear about what is effectively a pop song. So here we have erotica then, trying to defy the insistence by the establishment that power should be obscured by making power relationships explicit and consensual. And we'll move on hopefully quickly, because we are, time is moving on, to Like a Prayer, which is back in time, 1989, in March 1989. And that was written by Madonna and Patrick Leonard. And it made Madonna the most successful act of the 80s in the UK. And this was the sixth number one she got in that decade. David Bowie and Pet Shop Boys only managed four. It has five, more than five million sales to date. And the video was directed by Mary Lambert, who, like Fincher, would go on to make quite a seminal film, this time Pet Cemetery. So we'll have another quick clip of this one. This one will be a longer one because I like the song a lot. So um, I hope you enjoy it as well. So slightly longer clip there. Um, but again, as uh, Rothko tied back to Vogue, like a player, prayer slightly ties forward in a way um, to erotica. Like a Prayer, the album um, from which the single comes, was released with an inlay that outlines what is described there as the facts about AIDS. And most notably, it talks about how um, uh, uh, infection is influenced by sexual activity rather than sexual orientation. And it also talks about the impact of using condoms. And that, um, along with this idea that um, it isn't a disease that's tied to your, your morality um, or your, um, your lifestyle, because it says, that, as it says there, that AIDS um, was previously called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, which is not only offensive, I think most people would think that's an offensive way of calling it now, it is wrong. And the promotion of contraception outraged religious figures. And as I had mentioned at the start, Pope John Paul II himself said that the Blonde Ambition Tour is one of the most satanic shows in the history of humanity. And I think it's quite interesting that that's 30 years ago, but we still got videos like the recent one by Lil Nas causing exactly the same outcry. So we may have come forward in some areas, but we haven't in others. And Daniel Welsh, in a retrospective in the Huffington Post a few years ago, calls like a prayer a masterclass in pushing pop's boundaries. And again, another um, uh, idea of this transgression, a simple pop song causing all of this trouble. Like a Prayer, the video is a narrative video, unlike the uh, the ones that we've seen before, which are largely kind of vignettes. And it describes a young woman who's played by Madonna, who witnesses an assault. Um, a gang of uh, white men 
um, attack a woman and it's implied kill her by stabbing her. The police arrive and inevitably they arrest the wrong person. They arrest a black passerby who has come out of his house to see what's going on and is attempting to help the woman as the white perpetrators flee. Madonna's un uh, um, understandably scared by this and she flees to a church, the church that we see in the video. And in a vision, um, it seems that she's kind of um, either falls asleep or um, faints. She is forgiven her cowardice by this now animated statue of a black saint. And it's often believed um, that that statue is meant to depict Jesus, and it is um, uh, by both Madonna and uh, the director, but it's also inspired by Saint Martin de Porres, who is the patron saint of racial harmony, a mixed race person himself. And inspired by this uh, forgiveness and this welcoming, she then testifies and that leads to the release of the wrongfully arrested black man. And I think it's interesting that um, testimony and testifying and witnessing leads back to this um, idea of martyrdom. The words relate to the same root. And in the video, my, uh, Madonna does many um, uh, sort of symbolic acts, including uh, cutting her hand on a knife, um, which leads her to uh, have a stigmata. And that I think is what caused a lot of the, um, the complaints uh, from religious figures. But Mary Lambert there, the director, much later, said that the most important thing was to force people to reimagine their visual references and really root out their prejudices, using burning crosses to reference racism to religion. Why not a black Jesus? Why can't you imagine kissing him? I wanted to speak about ecstasy and to show the relationship between sexual and religious ecstasy. And you can see there in that gif, uh, Madonna, a large part of the video is uh, Madonna singing and dancing in front of these burning crosses. And again, that is a source of the large part of the controversy. But behind the controversy, and I think like a lot of Gothic works, you have this layer of, um, of shock and controversial um, aesthetic elements. You then have this powerful, I think, moral message. And it says that, yes, religion can foster bigotry and oppression. The burning crosses um, obviously tie back to the Ku Klux Klan and they indicate fundamentalism and white nationalism, white supremacy, and that's shown by the fact that the, um, the attackers are um, all white. And there's also the shock of a black religious figure. Why is that shocking? Um, Jesus was almost inevitably not white, and there are many um, black religious figures uh, throughout history. But religion can also inspire forgiveness and offer courage to people when they need it. Madonna is welcomed into the church by this black congregation, a woman who just um, stormed in in the middle of the night, um, but she is uh, welcomed as any um, pilgrim would be. And through this, she realizes that she must do the right thing. She must testify to what she's seen and make sure that the correct people are punished. And I think then tying back to that uh, description at the start, you have this pop song, a tissue of horrible and disgusting absurdity, which many people would claim provides um, a more powerful lesson of conduct, manners, and morality than that of the status quo. We would expect the police to arrest the wrong person, especially if it's a black person or another minority over um, a white figure. Um, and there are some um, concerns around this that it kind of ties into ideas of, of white savior narratives. Uh, it's Madonna who um, is the crux and kind of allows the black man to be freed. But I think, Overarchingly, um, she is trying to show that doing the right thing um, can deny these, um, these oppressive elements like nationalism and fundamentalism. So we go back to then to this idea of this chiaroscuro, and chiaroscuro isn't just light and dark, it's not just the shadows are here and the light is here and the spotlight is always in the same place. Chiaroscuro is the blend and the interaction and the flux between light and shadow. And that light and those shadows can be formed by um, lights and spotlights that move and change over time. And I think um, it kind of talks quite strongly that it is maybe up to us to do the right thing, to move the spotlight, to take the light away from things that don't necessarily need it, or have had it for too long, and use that to enlighten some of the more shaded areas um, that we don't know about or we ignore. Uh, or haven't been allowed to flourish properly. So I think then, like a prayer, it looks at this establishment need for logical immutable laws, the rule of law, the police, 
and it replaces them with an emotional, changeable chiaroscuro. So hopefully this is the final slide, small summation. I hope you've, I've made you think about Gothic Madonna um, and how she uses the Gothic and how the kind of Gothic um, penetrates through her work, through those three elements. And I think the main thing that I'm trying to get across to sum up an hour of talking is that like something like Frankenstein, which uses contemporary science and the concerns around contemporary uh, science and what that might lead us to do, it looks then at more timeless human morality. We look at what Frankenstein does with his abilities. We look at what that court, what um, that does to his creature, even though the creature um, uh, tries to be a good person. And that then leads us to look at how Madonna uses these elements to reflect and be reflected and to influence both her surroundings and the period in which she lives. And I think we see that um, coming through today. Thank you very much. That is the final slide. It is five minutes before the hour, so I was about the same time as last time. If you have any questions, um, criticisms, um, anything you'd like to talk about, uh, I am more than willing to try and answer them. But thank you very much for your time.